Good morning. It's still morning here by me. This is an impromptu video. Um, yesterday, I had a email correspondence with a beloved brother who spake to me of something that um, he had heard from another individual. And um, he spake to me of it and asked me of it assuming that I watch this other individual, which I do not. And um, it was a very interesting email correspondence that he and I had together. And it stirred something. It has stirred something. Please get your authorized version. Get your authorized version of the scriptures. Turn with me in your authorized version of the scriptures. To Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Um, depending on how this video goes, like I said, this is impromptu. Okay. Um, got some resources here that we're going to be looking at today. Okay. Secret Terrorists by, oh, excuse me, The Enemy Unmasked by Bill Hughes and also The Secret Terrorist by Bill Hughes. Bill Hughes, Seventh day Adventist. Bill Hughes, whose work on the Jesuit order is very good, just like another uh, fellow uh, Seventh-day Adventist of his, um, Walter Reith. Their work on the Jesuit order is phenomenal. It really is. Uh, I do not agree with, of course, Seventh-day Adventistism. Okay? I do not. We are not required salvifically to keep the Sabbath today to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Also, the Seventh-day Adventists, as far as I'm aware, do not believe in the redemption of the purchased possession before the time of Jacob's trouble, okay? Erroneously referred to as the pre-tribulation rapture, okay? And also, the Seventh-day Adventists teach that the mark of the beast is the cookie and ashes on the forehead, okay? Something like that, all right? Um... Their whole movement was begun and started by a woman. Warning! <laughs> but none, nevertheless, nevertheless, um, I, I recommend this book to any of you, The Secret Terrorists. And also, I recommend this book to you, The Enemy with Unmasked. Okay? Uh, like I said, I do not agree at all with his Seventh-day Adventist's views, but the work that Mr. Hughes has done on the Jesuit order speaks for itself. If we get to that, and we probably will. But let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 on to verse 9. Follow me along, word for word, verse by verse, at the things that we are going to be looking at today. Okay? Follow me along in the scriptures. To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, reaping a harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones. And a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. Hmm. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rent and a time to sow. And rent, that doesn't mean rent houses. Rent, tear, okay? <clears throat> a time to rent and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. With some of these people, brethren, some of these people who are falling for all the nonsense of today, you need to leave them alone. Hmm. Time to rent and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. 
Hmm. A time of war and a time of peace. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? So there's a time for everything under heaven. There's a time for this and a time for that. Is there a time coming that is going to usher in a time of prosperity? Hmm? Is there? Now, scripturally speaking, uh, I know a lot of the charismatics and a lot of people <coughs> are saying things like, oh, a revival is on the way. Well, scripturally, you don't even have a leg to stand on. The leg that you people who like to say that there's a revival coming, the one that leg that you like to stand on comes from another dispensation that is not pertinent relative for us today in this dispensation. In other words, you're taking things that are promised for the Jews, for the restoration of the Jews, the revival that will happen for the Jews. You're trying to take that from the Old Testament and apply it to today. To today. Uh-uh, uh-uh. That's a lot of what the latter uh, rain people uh, will do, okay? But here's the thing. Here's the thing, okay? Here is the thing. The steel of the Jesuit poniard and the Jesuits' massive push for everyone to, you know, roll it up and take the steel of the Jesuit poniard. And right now, that's kind of laying low, right? Except, I mean, I've been online looking at jobs and whatnot, right? And um, <laughs> there are some jobs that you have to be fully uh, required, that you have to be fully vaccinated. There are other jobs that uh, you need to be weekly tested. There are other jobs where you're going to wear a face mask. Yeah, and people are saying, and, and some of the stuff that you look at online in the news, that they can't find a, a, a enough people to fulfill these jobs that are there, right? I don't know if any of you have tried. I know there are some of you that have. Have you ever tried trying to find a job today online? Now, it is possible. I know that our, our best friend a while ago had gotten himself a job. At, uh, at a hotel and was there for a while and it was ultimately the Lord didn't approve of it. <laughs> but that, that that's old news for him. But he was able to get a job. Okay. But it also depends on the demographic at where you are at. I truly believe that. Like, for example, down south, it's probably a lot easier for people to uh, get work than it is up here at north because um, some of the stipulations and the hoops and hurdles that one has to go through. The news, the Jesuit-controlled media will have you to believe. And I'm speaking to my countrymen, but you of other nations take heed, take warning to this. The Jesuit-controlled media wants you to believe that there's all these jobs out there, that there's an overabundance of opportunity. But yet they hamper and hinder People coming to these opportunities with, with the steel of the Jesuit poniard, with, uh, you know, shoving something up your nose every week and some every day. No, no exceptions. You might have a health issue that you can't be like wearing a face mask. No exceptions, no exceptions. Hmm. It's not as easy as the Jesuit-controlled media would have you to believe. But the steel of the Jesuit poniard is in circulation. And eventually what's going to happen is, sooner or later, those who receive the steel of the Jesuit poniard Sooner or later, by some circumstance, whatever, oh, whether or not the Jesuits are going to turn up the 5G or whatever it's going to be, people are going to start dying at an alarming rate. Okay? People are going to start dying. Now, with this mass death that is gradually going to be coming, I believe, it is uh, 2022. Uh, there was a military site that um, 
said something about by 2025, a bunch of the population here in America was not going to be here anymore. Okay. Gee, I wonder why. I wonder why. This was on the Daggle uh, website, which is no longer to be found. Um, Mr. Denlinger, on his Rumble account, has a video which gives the proof and evidence that the Diego site actually gave warning of this by 2025, that uh, there was going to be a max mass like loss of population here in America by 2025, okay? So then, with that, though, with that, with the death of the wicked, does that mean that there's going to be a, pros a time of prosperity for the righteous? It's very interesting to consider, very interesting to think about. But let's think about this. Who's in control of America? Who's in control of America? That be the Jesuit order. The Vatican, Rome, is in control of America. Okay? America has not been independent in itself for many years. Many years. Okay? And the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve is the banking system of the Vatican. Okay? Now, bear with me here. Okay? Bear with me. We're going to look at an article here. Oops, oops, not that one. <laughs> there we go. Oops. Bear with me there, friends. Wait, wait one second, brethren. I'm trying to... Uh, Trying to get this figured out. There it is. Okay. There it is. There it is. Okay. The Federal Reserve. Recently, in recent times, the Federal Reserve has done some height, uh, some rate hikes. Okay. If you live in my nation of America, unless you live in a southern state that pretty much bucks the uh, system, you've noticed that prices have been skyrocketing here in America. Uh, the gas uh, the gas prices are going through the roof and also on the groceries in the grocery stores prices are just raising and raising and raising okay why is that why is that well that has something to do with the Jesuit order okay I'm gonna go through this article it's rather short uh, this is by NPR. The, um, the link for it will be in the description box for you to look over yourself. Four things to know as the Fed, the Federal Reserve, embarks on its biggest fight against inflation in years. Right, right. Okay, check this out. Now, I don't know who this Jesuit guy is, but uh, boy, doesn't he look happy? <laughs> All right. The Federal Reserve is about to deliver its biggest punch yet in the fight against surging inflation. Policymakers start a two-day meeting on Tuesday, and they are widely expected to raise interest rates by half a percentage point, the largest rate hike in more than two decades. It is, it is, it's a clear sign of the urgency with which the Fed, Federal Reserve, is approaching inflation as prices continue to climb at the fastest pace in 40 years. Well, yes, yes. They gave out the stimuli checks, right? See, the Jesuit order brought about a fictitious pandemic to break the economy. And then they, they uh, implement a mode of socialism and gave people a lot of money. Now it's time to pay that back. Okay? Now the debt, <laughs> the debt is owed unto the Vatican by this nation. Okay? This is their payback. Let's continue. 
And the Fed won't be done there. The central bank is likely to keep pushing borrowing costs higher in the months to come. Here's a quick look at the Fed's battle plan. Why is the Fed raising interest rates? The central bank, bank is worried that prices are climbing too rapidly as people continue to spend money from shopping for stuff to looking long to booking long delayed vacations. Excuse me. Demand is so strong, it's outpacing that Demand is so strong, it's outpacing what businesses can deliver. Given the global supply chains are still fragile and employers are still struggling to find enough workers. Struggling to find enough workers, but yet they have, they want people to go through all this elaborate palaver for these opportunities. Okay? <laughs> A daily test. Got to be fully vaccinated. Yeah. And also, too, unless depending on your demographic where you are at, uh, up here, up north by me, nobody's handing out paper applications. You all got to do it online now. Impersonal. Very, yeah, very deceiving. Let's continue. Uh a key measure from the Commerce Department has week, last week showed prices has surged 6.6% during the 12 months ending in March. That's more than three times the Fed's target rate for inflation and the sharpest increase in prices since 1982. The Fed hopes to tamp down demand and ease inflation by making it more expensive to borrow money. Note that for when we get to what um, Mr. Hughes writes about, okay? The Fed raised interest rates by a quarter of a percentage point in March, and it's expected to follow up this week with its first half-point rate hike since 2000. And there's a picture of Wally World. Yes, yes. Yes, prices for groceries have surged as inflation has hit its highest level in four decades. Yes. How much will the Fed raise interest rates? Potentially a lot more. Experts say interest rates may have to climb significantly, significantly to reduce demand after the Fed kept borrowing costs after the Fed kept borrowing costs at rock bottom levels through much of the coronavirus pandemic. Now they need their payback. Okay? Now they need their payback. Now they're, and see, borrowing. Raise the price on what it costs to borrow. And we're going to read a little about uh, this. Our government is borrowing money from the Vatican in order to pay everything. So you raise the interest rates on borrowing and our government is borrowing from the central uh, banking system in America, which is the Jesuit banking system, the Federal Reserve. It's a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe for destruction. Okay? The Weimar Republic who had their paper fiat currency, who, and uh, Brother Alberto Rivera, I mentioned this in a previous video, uh, talked about how people would take, bring wheelbarrows full of paper money trying to buy a gallon of milk and it wasn't enough. Hmm. Rough times are coming, brethren. Real rough times are coming. Let's continue. On average, excuse me, Fed policymakers said at their March meeting rates would need to rise nearly two full percentage points this year with additional rate increases next year. Fed Chair Jerome Powell said the central bank will keep a close eye on how the economy performs and adjust the pace of rate hikes as needed. 
But Powell thinks the Fed's usual practice of raising rates a quarter point at a time may not be enough. He suggests the central bank needs to move aggressively up front and then reassess as needed. It is appropriate, in my view, to be moving a little more quickly, Powell told an International Monetary Fund forum last month. I also think there's something in the idea of front-end loading whatever accommodation one thinks is appropriate. Very scary there. How will raising borrowing costs affect the economy? Raising interest rates make it more expensive to take out a car loan or carry a balance on a credit card. They also raise the cost of buying a home. Yeah, yeah. Mortgage rates have already soared above 5% in anticipation of the Fed's actions, up from less than 3% a year ago. That adds about 370 bucks to the monthly payment on a medium-priced house. Or on a median, median-priced house. Hmm. So mortgage rates are going to be rising and property stuff like that is going to be rising. But yet when everybody starts dying off, all this land's going to be available cheap. Or is it? Is it? Because who is in control still of America? Who is still in control? Hmm? Let's continue. Okay. The Fed's intent in raising rates is to discourage spending just enough to bring down inflation. So, raise the prices on everything so people can't afford to live. Unless, of course, you're already uh, in the esoteric crowd, the elites, and already got your little nest egg. Unlike us exoteric people, you know, the common folk who uh, are dependent on the Lord for everything. See, the esoteric, the elites, are not the ones who are generally going to be affected by this kind of stuff. But us es exoteric, common folk, we're the ones that are going to feel the pinch of this. Okay? Yes, the Fed's intent in raising rates is to discourage spending just enough to bring down inflation without tipping the economy into recession, what economists call a soft landing. That's our goal, Powell said. I don't think you'll hear anyone, anyone at the Fed say that that's going to be straightforward or easy. Some analysts are skeptical that the central bank can strike that delicate balance, having waited until inflation has climbed so high. They warn the kind of aggressive action that's now needed to control prices is likely to trigger an economic downturn. Dutch, Deutsche Bank, a German lender and major Wall Street firm, last week forecast a major recession next year. Those concerns contributed to last week's sharp sell-off in the stock market. <clears throat> okay, yeah, yeah, this is this. What other steps is the Fed taking? In addition to raising interest rates, the Fed is expected to announce plans to gradually reduce the collection of government bonds and mortgage-backed securities that it bought during the pandemic. Buying those bonds helped pump money into the economy and keep borrowing costs low. Reducing the Fed's holdings should have the opposite effect, tamping down demand and helping to curb inflation. It's a secondary tool, but it does remove quite a bit of liquidity, liquidity and accommodation for the system, said Kathy Bostogenek or whatever of Oxford Economics. Okay, and I believe that is all of it. But I want to I want to touch on this right here that we looked at. Okay. Oh, where was that? 
where it said that. Uh, bear with me here. Yes. Where it said that about um, the borrowing. About bar ah, borrowing. We were just looking at how will raising borrowing costs affect the economy? Raising interest rates will raising interest rates make it more expensive to take out a car loan or carry a balance on a credit card. They also raise the cost of buying a home. Mortgage, mortgage rates have already soared above 5% in anticipation of the Fed's action, actions, up from less than 3% a year ago. That adds about $370 to the monthly payment on a median priced house. <laughs> Yes, the Fed's intent to in raising rates is to discourage spending just enough to bring down inflation. Hmm. Well, the enemy unmasked. I'm going to read a little bit of, uh, of this to you. Okay, this is uh, I'm going to be reading. I'm going to be reading actually quite a bit. Okay. Going to be reading where my finger is here, down on this page right here. Pause that and read it, if you can. And also, all of this in its entirety. Okay? Let's, let's learn a little something about this Federal Reserve. Okay, we, we don't need to look at this anymore. Okay, we do not. So, let's learn a little bit about this Federal Reserve. Okay? By 1815, the Jesuits had complete control over England. If a leader did not do as he was told, money would be used to kill, smear, destroy, blackmail, or just drive the person from office. Later chapters will show that this procedure is being used today to control people like George W. Bush and Tony Blair. What was done in England is being done in many countries today. As the new nation of America began to spread its wings, it would need a sound financial base from which to operate. It needed a bank. All right. But the bank used America instead of America using the bank. But the bank used America instead of America using the bank. Hmm. Financial genius and opportunist Robert Morris organized the first central bank. He and his associates believed that the bank should be modeled after the Bank of England. While the first bank in North America was not as ruthless as the central banks of today, it performed many of the operations of a modern central bank. Secret investors put up $400,000 to start this bank. This bank lasted for two years. Will we identify the secret investors? We will, excuse me, identify the secret investors in following paragraphs. Please understand that the central bank's being established by the Jesuits and the Rothschilds are in no way similar to the neighborhood banks that we all use to manage our money. Let us take a closer look at the central bank and see why it is so dangerous. We will use the Federal Reserve Bank as an example. And very quickly, very quickly, the Federal Reserve from this book, the Federal Reserve, about the sinking of the Titanic. Okay, I'm going to read this part right here. Okay, where my fingers are. Okay, pause that and read it if you can. Okay, the highlighted stuff. And then we're going to go to here. Uh, where was that? Uh, also in the same chapter. And we're going to finish off with this highlighted thing here. Okay, where my fingers are, pause that and read it. Okay? All right. Federal Reserve Bank. <clears throat> the greatest tragedies 
in the last 200 years can be traced to the Jesuits. We will now show that the Jesuits planned on and carried out the sinking of the Titanic. And we will show why they did it. And there's that documentary on this channel about the Jesuits where they go over this, okay? Just want to share this with you. Since the, 18, since the early 1830s, America did not have a central bank. The Jesuits desperately wanted another central bank in America so that they would have a bottomless reservoir from which to draw money for their many wars and other hideous schemes around the world. Case in point, without a central bank, without the Federal Reserve, there is no World War I. There is no World War II. There is no Vietnam War. There is no Persian Gulf War. Okay? The Federal Reserve people is the Bank of the Vatican. Okay? We as Americans are using Jesuit currency. Okay? We are using Jesuit currency. All right? In 1910, seven men met on Jekyll Island just off the coast of Georgia to establish a central bank, which they called the Federal Reserve Bank. The bank is the Jesuits' bank, okay? Now, towards the closing of this chapter, one of the greatest tragedies of the 20th century, the sinking of the Titanic, lies at the door of the Jesuit order. The unsinkable ship, the Floating Palace, was created to be the tomb for the wealthy who opposed the Federal Reserve System. By April 1912, all opposition to the Federal Reserve was eliminated when they sank on the Titanic. In December of 1913, the Federal Reserve System came into being in the United States. Eight months later, the Jesuits had sufficient funding through the Federal Reserve Bank to begin World War I. Yes, dear friends. Yes, the Federal Reserve. Okay? You know, I don't, we don't have any money. <laughs> We're broke. But the Federal Reserve, you, my countrymen, you take out your dollar bill, Federal Reserve note. We use Jesuit currency in this nation as money. Okay? I wish it weren't so, but it is so. Okay? Okay? The Federal Reserve is the Jesuit banking system, dear friend. Okay? You have to understand that. Now let's continue in this. Here is a very simplified scenario that pretty much explains one of the operations of the Federal Reserve Bank. It is necessary to understand that the Federal Reserve Bank is not owned by the United States government, as many believe. The Federal Reserve it is not owned by us, people, my countrymen. We, America, do not own the Federal Reserve Bank. Who owns it? The Vatican! The Jesuits! <laughs> the Vatican owns the Federal Reserve Bank. Okay? Okay? <laughs> the Central Bank, the Federal Reserve Bank, is a private bank owned by some of the richest and most powerful people in the world, Jesuits. Okay? This bank has nothing to do with the U.S. government other than the collection which allows the operation described below. The private Federal Reserve Bank has a total government-enforced monopoly in money. You control the economy of a nation, and you control that nation. You control the food supply of that nation. You control the nation. You control the media of a nation. You control the nation. The Jesuit order here in America, they control the money. They are just about to grab total control of the food supply. Okay? They control the media. 
and social media like YouTube as well. Okay, they also control the health uh, thing. Okay, they control they control virtually everything. Okay, hence America is a Jesuit nation. All right. <clears throat> yes, the federal the private Federal Reserve Bank has a total government enforced monopoly in money. Before we had the central bank, each individual bank competed with other banks. The customers, the consumers, got the best deal. Not anymore. We all know that today the United States government borrows... Now, remember with the article that we read? We all know that, that today the United States government borrows money and operates under astronomical debt. Why is this? Common sense dictates that a policy of such enormous debt would sooner or later destroy the organization that practices it because the interest on its debt must increase beyond its income, making payoff possible. And remember in the book of Exodus, and the, the Lord had me to do a video about this, about the um, coming famine, long before some other people did, okay? But Joseph, you know, he, the people, they were poor, they had no money, and uh, they said, hey, buy us, buy us and our lands and give us seed when money fail, okay? Hence, Joseph bought up all of Egypt for Pharaoh at that time. And remember, the Pharaoh uh, at Joseph's time was a decent ruler. Okay? We have to remember that. Yes. But the point is, common sense dictates that a policy of such enormous debt would sooner or later destroy the organization that practices it. Because the interest on it, on its debt, must increase beyond its income, making payoff impossible. For example, you borrow 20 bucks, in the long run to pay it back, you're gonna be paying 80 bucks in interest. So you borrow 20 bucks for whatever, in interest and in borrowing, according to the Federal Reserve way of doing things, the Jesuit way of doing things, you're gonna pay back 80 bucks for the 20 that you spent or that you borrowed. And think about this. Here in my country of America, looking at jobs today, um, there's not a job that offers under, under $12 an hour. $12 an hour. Now, here in America, if you are like between 15 and, uh, between 15 and 17, yes, you can get away with being like, employers can, pay you only like nine bucks or something, uh, something like that, you know. And a lot of businesses, a lot of fast food places do that. They hire kids from between 15 and 17 because they're cheaper. But, you know, the guy that flips the burger to the people at the gas station, making upwards to 15 to 17 dollars an hour. So everybody's getting raises, and yet prices are skyrocketing. Something's going to break here pretty soon, don't you think? Let's continue this. Now to our scenario. Here roughly is how the operation proceeds. Suppose the United States government wants to borrow a billion dollars. The government issues a bond for this amount, which as a water company does when it wants to raise money for a new pipeline or a new dam. The government delivers this bond for the billion dollars to the Federal Reserve Bank, the Jesuit Bank. The Federal Reserve Bank takes the bond and writes an order to the Department of Printing and Engraving to print the, pr to print the billion dollars worth of bills. After about two weeks or so, when the bills are printed, the Department of Printing and Engraving ships the bills to the Federal Reserve Bank which then writes a check for about $2,000 to pay for printing the uh, billion dollars worth of bills. 
The Federal Reserve Bank then takes the billion dollars and lends the billion dollars to the United States government. Okay? And the people of the country pay interest at an exorbitant rate each year on this money. Which came out of nothing. Magic! Just poof! Just appeared. The owners of the Federal Reserve Bank put up nothing for this money. See, it used to be that the currency in this nation was backed by actual physical, literal gold and silver. And we're going to be talking a little bit about gold and silver as we continue here, okay? But it used to be that our currency was backed by gold and silver. But since the Jesuits have overtaken this nation and all the, the major banks and whatnot, okay, the central bank, the Federal Reserve Bank, they stole our gold and silver. There are those out there who says, right now, buy gold and silver. Get gold and silver for when the paper collapses. Okay, so then you're going to go to Walmart with a chunk of gold and say, here, let me buy my groceries with this. How's that exchange going to work out? It's not. It's not. Because you're going to need a vehicle in to exchange it. Hence, paper currency. You see? It's a trap. It's a system designed to destroy anything. What was that? Yes. We all know that today the United States government borrows money and operates under astronomical debt. Why is this? Common sense dictates that a policy of such enormous debt will sooner or later destroy the organization that practices it. Which is the whole intent. We see, therefore, that when the United States government goes into debt one dollar, a dollar plus the interest goes into the pockets of the owners of the Federal Reserve Bank. And who owns the Federal Reserve Bank? The Jesuits! The Vatican! Okay? Rome! Rome owns the Jesuits, uh, the own Rome's, uh, own, uh, Rome owns the Federal Reserve Bank. Beg your pardon for us tripping over my tongue, okay? Rome owns the Federal Reserve, people. Rome! <laughs> this is the largest, the most colossal theft ever perpetuated in the history of mankind. And it is so slick, so subtle, and so obf obfusc obfuscated by propaganda from the news media that the victims are not even aware of what is happening. You can see why the Jesuits want to keep this operation secret. The Constitution of the United States gives its Congress the power to coin money. If Congress coined its own money as the Constitution directs, it would not have to pay the hundred, hundreds of billions of dollars of interest that it now pays each year to the bankers for the national debt from money that came out of nothing. Money coined by Congress would be debt free. All the central banks and other countries operate the way the Federal Reserve does. Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton submitted a proposal to Congress in 1790 for a central bank. Interestingly enough, Hamilton had been an aide of Robert Morris in the initial experience of central banking in North America. Surprisingly, during the Constitutional Convention of 1787, Hamilton had been a strong supporter of sound money, like with the Federalist Papers and stuff like that. Okay? That Hamilton completely shifted his position within three years and proposed a central bank, 
which could generate the phony money as the Federal Reserve Bank does, shows that Hamilton's loyalty was completely compromised by the Jesuits. Yes, the one who helped author the uh, Federalist Papers, okay, turn on us, turn on this nation, bought out by the Vatican, the Jesuits. Mm -hmm. And that was in 1787, people, okay? Notice the title of the book this next quote is taken from. The creature from Jekyll Island is the Federal Reserve Bank. This bank was planned by conspirators who met for this purpose on Jekyll Island. And we'll read this, uh, we'll read this, and then that'll be it, okay? This is hard to reconcile, and one must suspect that even the most well-intentioned of men can become corrupted by the temptations of wealth and power. Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! Some good, godly men. Yes. Even the most well-intentioned of men can become corrupted by the temptations of wealth and power. G. Edward Griffin, The Creature from Jekyll Island, American Opinion, page 328. <clears throat> so, the Federal Reserve Banking System is a system of debt designed to destroy whatever nation implements it. And them raising the interest rates to pay back the debt. They're, they're saying that they're doing it to curb inflation. No. They're doing it to put the last nail in the coffin of this country. How much longer America has to go? I don't know. I don't know. But as we have all seen, as we have all seen, they keep raising the prices, raising the prices, raising the prices. And unless you're an esoteric elitist who has 40,000 reasons to smile, most of the common folk, the exoteric, are going to be the ones who suffer. Go to Ezekiel chapter 7. Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 7. Five, six, seven. Ezekiel chapter 7, verses 5 on to verse 19. Ezekiel chapter 7, verses 5 on to verse 19. Thus saith the Lord God, an evil, and only evil, behold, is come, an end is come. The end is come. It watcheth for thee, behold, it is come. The morning is come unto thee, O thou that dwellest in the land. The time is come, the day of trouble is near, and not the sounding again of the mountains. And there is a time for everything under heaven. Now will I shortly pour out my fury upon thee, and accomplish mine anger upon thee, and I will judge thee according to thy ways. And will recompense with an S thee for all thine abominations. And you look at America. All that America has done. This wicked nation of mine. Oh boy. Oh boy. And mine eye shall not spare. Neither will I have pity. I will recompense with an S. Thee according to thy ways, and thine abominations that are in the midst of thee. And ye shall know that I am the Lord that smiteth. What's, what is coming upon our nation is going to be so severe, so drastic, so chaotic, 
that, and ye shall know that I am the Lord that smiteth. When destruction comes unawares in such a fashion that it's like, wow, this couldn't be, this couldn't be just the happenstance of men. No, there's more to it than that. Judgment. Judgment. Amen. Behold the day. Behold it is come. The morning is gone forth. The rod hath blossomed. Pride hath budded. Pride hath budded. Got 40,000 reasons why to smile and rub it into people's faces, huh? Sure do. So do many of the esoteric crowd. Yeah. Yeah. While everyone beneath you is starving, struggling. But yet, here you got these people up on their pedestals telling you of how great they are and how good they're doing. And oh, it must suck to be you. Yeah. Yeah. Never did care for people like that. <clears throat> Violence has risen up into a rod of wickedness. None of them shall remain, nor, nor of their multitude, nor of any of theirs. Neither shall there be wailing for them. The time has come, the day draweth near. Let not the buyer rejoice, nor the seller mourn. For wrath is upon all the multitude thereof. For the seller shall not return to that which is sold. Although they were yet alive. For the vision is touching the whole multitude thereof, which shall not return. Hmm. Neither shall any strengthen himself in the iniquity of his life. They have blown the trumpet, even to make already, but none goeth to the battle. For my wrath is upon all the multitude thereof. The sword is without, and the pestilence, and the famine within. He that, is, he that is in the field shall die with the sword. And he that is in the city, famine and pestilence, shall devour him. Mm. But they that escape of them shall escape, and shall be on the mountains like doves of the valleys. All them mourning, every one for his iniquity. All hands shall be feeble, and all knees shall be weak as water. They shall also gird themselves with sackcloth, and horror shall cover them. And shame shall be upon all faces, and baldness upon all their heads. They shall cast their silver in the streets, and their gold shall be removed. Their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They shall not satisfy their souls, neither fill their bowels, because it is the stumbling block of their iniquity. Now, during the time of Jacob's trouble, gold and silver is not going is you're it's going to be no use. Okay? Yes, gold and silver is scriptural currency. Yes, it is. But that man of sin, the son of perdition, is going to be implementing the mark of the beast. So if there's gold and silver, why have the mark of the beast? See. Gold and silver is going to be fluctuated to become nothing so that the mark of the beast can be implemented. Okay? Gold and, our economy crashes today. And all you guys got gold and silver. Okay? What, how are you, you going to go to Walmart to get your bread and all your goodies and stuff you need and you're going to take a, like your knife and cut a, cut a piece of your gold bar off and here, take this. Well, how much is that worth? What can I buy for it? Here, take it, take it. What's the exchange going? How are you going to exchange it? Hmm? It's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. And judgment is coming upon this nation. Judgment is coming upon America. It's unavoidable. It's going to happen. But see, when people start dying off, does that mean that one, because, well, think of the principle. The wicked die, the weak, 
that the strong, the righteous, might survive. So with all this stuff, with all these people dying off and with all this stuff coming upon us, does that mean that there will be coming perhaps a big time of prosperity before the time of Jacob's trouble? Hmm. Now, I, I can kind of understand. I can, I, I can understand and see where someone might arrive at that, at that idea. I'll show you what I'm talking about, okay? Go to, um, let's go to Proverbs chapter 13, okay? Proverbs chapter 13, okay? Proverbs chapter 13, verses 18 on to verse 23. Verses 18 on to verse 23. Proverbs 18. Oh, Proverbs 13, excuse me. Verses 18 on to verse 23. Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction. But he that regardeth reproof shall be honored. The desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, but it is abomination to the fools to depart from evil. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. And your companion with fools, in going along with the Jesuit Federal Banking, uh, Federal Reserve Bank, and getting into debt and all these things like that. Hmm. Okay, okay, okay. Evil pursueth sinners, but to the righteous good shall be repaid. A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Hmm. So the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Okay. And verse 23, much food is in the tillage of the poor. But there is, that is destroyed for want of judgment. Hmm. And the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. And also you can go to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 24 on to verse 26. There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink, and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw, that it was from the hand of God. For who can eat, or who else can hasten hereunto more than I? For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom, and knowledge, and joy. But to the sinner he giveth travail, to gather and to heap up, that he may give to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. Hmm. So I guess you could, you know, there are launching pads where you could say that, okay, okay, right, well, right there, you know. But to the sinner he giveth travail, to gather and to heap up that he may give to him that is good before God. So with all this death that's going to be coming into America and all this catastrophe and the famine that is coming, does that mean that eventually at the end of it there's going to be a time of booming prosperity for those that remain? Kind of like a heaven on earth kind of thing? Oh, sure, for the esoteric crowd, sure. But for the exoteric people, you know, the common folk, I don't think so. I don't think so. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 3 on to verse 15. Okay? This is written unto the Jew who is going to inherit the promised land. Okay? He's going to go get it. All right? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 3 on to verse 15. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee. 
in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Yes, the word of God, the scriptures, our Lord Jesus Christ, him, he is to be our everything. We are to center our lives around him, not him around us. Okay, there's a difference. Okay, does America do that today? Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Okay. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And, and the frontlets between thine eyes, that's where you see the Jewish people wearing that thing of scripture on their head, okay? And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates, and some Jewish people do, I've seen it. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities, which thou buildest not. Okay. And houses full of all good things, which thou fillest not. And wells dig, which thou diggest not. Vineyards and olive trees, which thou plantest not. When thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him, and shalt swear by his name. Ye shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are around about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Hmm. So see, the Jesuit order through the Federal Reserve Bank with their interest rate hikes, this is all designed to break, to collapse this nation financially, okay? Prices are going to keep rising. There will come a time when they'll come back down again, yay, yay, probably. But see, the, the Jesuits, they want to destroy this nation. And... They raise the price on borrowing, and our government borrows money from the Jesuits to pay things. And hence, that debt that our nation here owes the Vatican, how are they going to pay? How, how are we going to pay that back? Oh, only with the death of most of us. Hmm. The debt will be paid with the lives of many of my countrymen. already a bunch of people, dead men walking. Hmm. But but there again, when all this stuff comes to pass, does this mean necessarily that there's going to be a time of prosperity? Because, hey, all these wicked people are going to go away, right? They're going to die, and then all this stuff is going to be available, so there's going to be a time of prosperity. But, okay, all these people die. Who is still in control of this nation? That be the Jesuits. That be the Jesuits. I don't buy it. I don't think so. I don't believe so at all. And also, too, dear friends, um, let's remember here in... Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 9, Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 1 under verse 6. Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to, he to heaven, a people great and tall, the children of the Anakims, who thou knowest, of whom thou hast heard say, who can stand before the children of Anak? Understand, therefore, this day, that the Lord thy God is he, which goeth over before thee as a consuming fire. He shall destroy them, and he shall bring them down before thy face. So shalt thou drive them out, and destroy them quickly, as the Lord has said unto thee. 
Speak not in thine heart, after the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord doth drive them out from before thee, not for thy righteousness, or for the uprightness of thine heart dost thou, doest thou go to possess their land. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, and that he may perform the word which the Lord sware unto thy fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand therefore, that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness. For thou art a stiff-necked people. Hmm. Today, today in this dispensation, has anyone been promised by the Lord lands, heritages? No, that comes during the kingdom of heaven. Okay, when we receive our inheritance. Oh, there are inheritances from father to son and father to children, yes. But does something like this apply for us today? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Brethren, we have to keep in mind what say the scriptures, okay? What say the scriptures about today? Is there when all this collapse happens and then, you know, like there's going to be all this prosperity available when the wicked is removed and then the righteous can sweep, come in and sweep everything up. So that means that there's going to be a big time of prosperity before the redemption of the purchased possession? Hmm. Well, okay. That'd be, hey, that'd be great. That'd be great if that were the if that were the case. But what say it the scriptures? What say it the scriptures? Uh, what about uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? Okay? <laughs> 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 2 on to verse 3. Uh, 1, verse, uh, 1 through verse 3. But of the times and the seasons, brethren. Ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as to veil upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, well, well and then, of course, what about Second Timothy chapter 3? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 on to verse 5. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And we are in the last days. And perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures. Uh, uh, yeah, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. Hmm. Okay. What about Second Peter chapter 3? Second Peter chapter three, verses one on to verse four. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. For the love of money is the root of all evil, for which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Yes. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Mm -hmm. And through covetousness shall they with 
profane words. Make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. And their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, uh, <laughs> And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth per person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. Verse 7. And delivered just Lot, vexed it with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed it, his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Hmm. So, is there going to be coming a time of great prosperity here in America? What about generally? When the results the consequences of the steal of the Jesuit poniard start taking hold across the world. Hmm. So, before the redemption of the purchased possession, quite possibly a time of booming prosperity? For some, yes. Yes, for some. But see, brethren, people, you got to remember... A lot of the people who preach to you are not like us. How so, Brad? They have it made. They have it made. All the while they say they have nothing, but they have it made. They have it made. They're not plagued as other men. <laughs> you know what that brings to my mind here I'm going to use this this one because I'm not going to you know what that brings to mind that brings to mind Psalm 73 I believe that is Psalm 73 Psalm 73 Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. And we are to condescend to men of low estate, remember. They are not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. Do you wonder what, whether or not your bills are going to get paid for this month, huh? Do you wonder whether or not you're going to be able to keep the power on? Hmm? Do you wonder whether or not you're going to be evicted this month? Hmm? Do you wonder that? Hmm. How easy it is for those who are in opulence to speak unto the exoteric, <laughs> to the common folk, the things of prosperity when they themselves are as lambs or as goats fed for the slaughter. Isn't that something? But yet the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. Hmm. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt. And 
and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain, and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me, until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then understood I their end. This is where the psalm turns. Virtually almost every single psalm that you will read has a turning point. Every, almost every single one, almost every single one has a turning point. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, until, turning point, I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places, thou castest them down into destruction. Excuse me. <laughs> Those who are well off, they have it, hard, they have it worse than us, who are poor who can't pay our bills, who are struggling to get by every day. It is truly us versus them, brethren. And our Lord says, blessed are the poor. Blessed are the poor. Paul knew what it was to abound and to be abased. Jesus Christ, God our Father, was basically homeless for his three years of ministry. He had nowhere to lay his head. Hmm. Kind of gives you a perspective, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awaketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image, their image that they made for themselves. Thus my heart was grieved. I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. There's nothing more on this earth I want more than our Lord Jesus Christ. What about you? My flesh and my heart faileth. God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Brethren, people, to everything there is a purpose, a time. What does that say in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 again, right? The very first opening uh, of that verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. <laughs> Second Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 20 under verse 27. Talking about Naaman, the Syrian, who was healed by Elisha. Okay? But Gyazi, servant of Elisha, 
didn't really care for the fact that the man, a Syrian, was cured of his leprosy. And the man offered on to Elisha a whole bunch of goods. Like, hey, hey, man, here. And Elisha's like, no, no, dude, I don't want to go away. Take, take your stuff and go. Praise the Lord. Yeah, you're healed. Good. Go. I don't want your stuff. But Gyazi. But Gyazi, the servant of Elisha. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 20 on to verse 27. But Gehazi, the servant of Elijah, the man of God, said, Behold, my master has, has spared Naaman the Syrian in not receiving at his hands that which he brought. But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. So Gehazi followed after Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him and said, It's all well. And he said, all is well. My master has sent me, saying, Behold, even now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. And the man said, Be content, take two talents. And he urged them, and bound two talents of silver in two bags, with two changes of garments, and laid them upon two of his servants, and they bare them before him. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hand and bestowed them in the house. And he let the men go and they departed. But he went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? And he said, Thy servant went no whither. And he said unto him, Went not mine heart with thee when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? Oh. Is the time to receive money and to receive garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants? The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. You know, in the midst of all that death and the uh, Jesuit order is still in control of this nation. Who do you think is openly going to take control and seize, the lands, seize those lands that are left behind by all these wicked people who die? It's going to be Jesuit-controlled opposition, Jesuit-controlled bankers, Jesuit-controlled um, investors. We're going to buy the land of America for Pharaoh. Already have, pretty much, but officially, when people start dying and all these wicked people go away. I don't, I don't buy that for one second, that when all this stuff starts happening and collapse comes and all this stuff starts to go down, that there's going to, as a result, possibly be a time of great prosperity before the catching away of the body of Christ. I don't buy it. Within the Old Testament, yes, you can find things to base that upon, but what dispensation are we in today? And in Scripture, you read nothing but the negative, <laughs> that it's not going to get better before the catching up of the body of Christ before the redemption of the purchase possession. Actually, it's going to get worse. There are going to be some of those who are opulent, in opulence, who are going to thrive, yes. But see, brethren, you have to remember, those people are the esoteric, the elite few. While most of us most of us are going to suffer for it. While there is going to be some sitting on whatever, doing whatever. It's us the small people that are going to pay for it. Aren't you glad to be small and despised? I am. <laughs> so I just, I just, Wanted to throw this at you, dear brethren. Um, 
Our hope, our hope is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who is the blessed hope. He is the resurrection and the life. Okay? Jesus Christ is our hope. He is our hope. If we don't have Christ, then what have we? What hope do we have? If we do not have Christ. He is our hope. He is our everything. He is our all. Let that be enough. Let that be enough. So, it's going to be it for this uh, very impromptu video. Like I said, very impromptu as you can see and tell. It wasn't really as organized as some of the other videos have been. Um, and I apologize for that, but I wanted to address this because, uh, like I said, it was a very interesting correspondence that I had with a brother uh, yesterday. And, um, and yes, you know, with the times coming, we need to fear the Lord and we need to align our lives with the scriptures. Yes, we do. Amen. We need to be fearing the Lord because of what is coming upon us. But in the desolation of the wicked and all that the wicked leave behind, you know, um, with what the wicked leave behind, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 25 and 26. The graven images of their God shall ye burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein. For it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. But thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. These things, these, these lands, these, the stuff that gets left behind, is that going to be meat for us to take as a church and live God? <laughs> you really think that after all this death and uh, chaos that's bound to happen to this nation, the famine that is coming um, with everything on the horizon, that that's going to be an opportunity for the church, the living God, to pick up these things? I don't think so. I don't think so. Why? Because here in America, Rome still rules. So, just wanted to make this little video um, and share some information with you, share some opinions and thoughts on this kind of stuff. And um, <laughs> let us ever be hopeful. And keep our ears open and attend for that call. Come up hither. Which I believe could happen at any day. I truly believe that. I believe that it could happen at any day. Any day. It's not a get out of jail free card. But it could happen at any time brethren. It could happen at any time. And we need to live our lives in that expectation that it could. And what manner of man are you going to be when the Lord calls you? So, it's going to be it for this video. Thank you so much for watching this if you do. Hope this gives you something to think about. We love you. Thank you for all of you who help us and pray for us. We love you so very much. Thank you. We'll see you in the next video.